Okay, uh, I've been given the go ahead that we can start. So, uh, so today's webinar, today's topic is basically Rewind series. Uh, it's on gold, uh, gold mining and silver. So this is a presentation that I have done, you know, a couple of times before, and uh, uh, it's not only for M2W. I've also done it for, you know, our uh, PMS sphere, which is a multi-asset PMS. Uh, so I've just added a couple of more slides uh, just to highlight what has happened uh, in 2023 and what the outlook is for 2024. So, uh, you know, one of the most common questions that we keep getting is why do we have to allocate to gold at all? Uh, isn't it a low yielding asset? Why do I need to put some money in gold? I can just stick to equity and uh, you know continue to make high returns. So is that really the case? Uh, is, is gold really a low yielding product? Uh, so let's look at this quilt now. This quilt uh, keeps coming every year from Live Mint, and uh, it just highlights the best asset classes uh, in that one particular year, right? So if you look at the entire entire quilt, right? This is from 2010 all the way to 23. Every year there is a new winner, and every year there is a new loser, right? So that's why we say invest for a long term. You can just capture all the cycles as and when it takes place. But here you see. Uh, Gold doing well uh, for since 2010, it has done two years, and then you had one more great year, and then from there on, you had three years of you know bad years where the price of gold started to come off. Again, in 2018 is when uh, gold started to do extremely well, and gold still continues to do very well. You are still seeing gold on the high level uh, even now because this uh, in 2023 uh, your small and mid did extremely well. Uh, but your gold also has held up pretty strong from where it has gone up from. Right? It is already at a high base and a high base going up is, is a very, very strong sign. right? So if you see gold has been a consistent performer since 2018. Right? Uh, and every time there is a new winner in terms of other asset classes, you see some of your small caps do well, some of your large caps do well, some of your internationals do well. Right? So the whole point is, is uh, for you to consistently build into one particular asset class for an extremely long period of time. And in this particular case, gold has done very, very well since 2018. It's been a consistent performer. Right? Now, uh, how do you value an investment like gold? Right? So when we look at gold, we just look at three things. One, supply, demand, and utility. Basically, uh, what is out there? What is the demand for that one particular uh, uh, metal? And how? what is the use case of these particular metals? So you already know that the use cases of gold are, are very, very high. They are not only used in jewelry, but they are also used in electronics. So the demand is very, very good. Now, the only problem is supply. Now, if you look at gold demand, now this is since 2010. These are all publicly available data. Uh, your jewelry always stands out. But what has been increasing in the last couple of years is the central bank demand. Now, if you look at the central bank demand, who is actually buying that gold? Uh, they are all emerging central banks. Uh, India happens to be one of them, but majorly they are all emerging central banks that are buying up gold after COVID. Right? So central bank demand is at an all-time high. Now, if you look at the supply, what is really coming down from the ground? Uh, it's very, very stagnant. The number has not gone up at all uh, in the last 13 years. If you see, it's somewhere around uh, 1,250 tons that is being mined. Uh, uh, at the total supply of gold is somewhere around 1,050 tons, where your demand is much, much higher, right? That's why you have a good uh, price appreciation that happens for gold. Right? So we are in a place where the demand for gold is going up, but there is no supplies that are coming in. So mine production is very, very concise. So if you look at this data, it doesn't show that there's any, you know, increase in the supply of gold at all. Right? It has been stagnant for the last 13 years. Now, uh, like I said, where is the demand really coming from? It's coming from central banks. Right? Global central banks are now buying gold and the, the pace at which they are buying and the quantity at which they are buying, it is at an all-time high. Right? So you saw lull years between 2000 and 2010 where uh, central banks were not at all buying gold. Right? Here you are having a place since 2010 where central bank purchasing gold is extremely high. Right? So, uh, and... Uh, unlike ETF demand, right, where uh, the flows uh, keep changing, it can go, uh, there some years might be, or some months can be in flow, some months can be outflow. Uh, central bank demand is very, very strong. Right? 
it's not uh, it's a very sticky uh, sort of a demand it doesn't change okay. uh, so how does inflation really impact gold this is another question that we keep getting that yeah i can buy you know gold but uh, from what i have read online uh, from all the sources that have been coming out uh, high inflation is not really good for gold or high interest rate is not really good for gold what is the case for gold how do i really go out and start looking at gold when inflation continues to be really sticky now the outlook for 2024 is that uh, global inflation is going to be very sticky we uh, we have decoupled and our inflation is under control we have seen high inflation uh, historically also so for us it's not going to be that big of a problem right but our comparison to uh, 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 other developed nations and other developing nations uh, has to be only seen that we are a very diverse nation right? Uh, we are flourishing uh, with high inflation. We do flourish with. Uh, we have been flourishing with high inflation. So how does it really impact? Uh, so how does global inflation really impact gold? Now, when you look at uh, the gold returns during different inflation regimes, this is all backdated from 1971. Okay? If you see, whenever inflation has been between four and six percent, you're seeing caggers north of nine percent. Uh, when you see very high inflation. Uh, you are seeing uh, somewhere, you know, where there is hyperinflation. People do want to go to an alternate currency, right? But uh, generally speaking, uh, in any case whatsoever, with inflation or without inflation, gold somewhere. This is all uh, global gold. This is U.S. gold. It's not INR gold. U.S. gold. I, INR gold. You have to look at currency depreciation also. But uh, U.S. gold does somewhere hover somewhere around eight percent to nine percent. That is from a normal perspective. You you adjust for inflation. And the number uh, somewhere on the lower side, but uh, it is a hedge to to that inflation. It is a hedge to currency, right? So gold continues to do well in different inflation regimes, uh, no matter how that one particular inflation is, right? Uh, now this is just a poll. Uh, so what was gold's performance versus other currencies? What do you think is the performance? Uh, is it three to five percent? Is it five to eight percent? Is it eight to eleven percent? Is it or is it 11 to 15. So you can uh, put in your answers in the chat box. Okay, a lot of C's and a lot of B's. So let's really look at it. Now, gold's performance since 2000, right? This is in various currencies. So why have I taken currencies is because you have to compare an, a currency to a currency. You cannot compare currency to equity. It's not the right comparison at all. Okay. And gold is an alternate currency. Uh, so if you look at the data, it's somewhere between 8 to 11%. So whoever had commented 8 to 11%, kudos, you're right. Uh, so this is over various years, right? Uh, where uh, your gold CAGR uh, since 2000 has somewhere been around uh, 8 to 11% for all currencies put together, right? So if you look at INR, uh, the CAGR happens to be somewhere around 11%, whereas your long term Nifty CAGR is somewhere around, uh, you know, 12, 12.5 to 13.5%, right? So for a extremely risky asset uh, like equity, you are uh, being compensated just by a percentage or two uh, in terms of CAGR for when you compare it to a less risky asset, like or there is no risk in that one particular you know asset class that is gold. So this is how you should be seeing uh, gold when you compare it to an a riskier asset class, right? Where yes, you know a non-risky asset is giving you this much return. How much return should a risky asset give you? It should give you much higher, right? So that should be your base, and your actual comparison should be between. A currency to a currency and that's why you see here uh, the comparisons between a currency and a currency right so gold doesn't phenomenally well over the over the last 13 years uh, in terms of 
uh, you know being a currency to the world now we always get this question of uh, should i do silver or isn't silver better than gold or uh, can i just do one asset class but uh, no uh, this cycle has proved that yes precious metals do need to be looked at uh, a basket they need to be in a basket approach uh, and what is happening to the silver side is that uh, there is a complete uh, uh, supply mismatch which means uh, uh, the demand is far more higher than what is actually there in terms of supply right and uh, this has happened in the last 3 years right so if you look at uh, historically we've had a good amount of uh, uh, supply when it comes to silver but the, the, the demand has been very low right, in the past uh, 10 years but what has happened in the last 3 years the use cases of silver also have been increasing they are also being used in electronics uh, since the use cases are actually going up you are seeing that uh, there is not a lot of silver that's there uh, for us to go out and uh, and mine what happens to silver is is that it comes along uh, with gold as an equivalent right so we always consider silver as uh, an equivalent to gold yeah, because when we mine gold it it comes out uh, along with uh, uh, gold you know as a as a gold equivalent so what has been happening is you are seeing that the demand is going up and uh, uh, there's not a lot of supply to uh, match it right? so that's what happened that's why that's why you are seeing this extreme volatility in silver that's why you are seeing silver uh, sometimes doing extremely well than that of uh, gold now let's look at silver also so what do you think was silver's performance versus other currencies same options 3 to 5 5 to 8 8 to 11 and 11 to 15 okay we are having a good amount of c's and d's so let's let's look at uh, the performance it's very volatile <laughs> it is extremely volatile it ranges you know somewhere around 3 and 5 sometimes it's 5 and 8 sometimes it's 9 and 11 so it's very very volatile and if you look at the chart compared to gold also uh, gold doesn't have a lot of reds it very uh, very less uh, reds you know whenever there is a deep Uh, problem uh, globally is there sometimes you're seeing that you know there is a slight negativity and then uh, positivity does, does come in so if you look at the volatility when it comes to gold here uh, it's very low compared to that of silver yeah so if you look at this there are a lot of red it's very very volatile and the returns keep <clears throat> uh, jumping uh, uh, you know from 3 and 5 5 and 8 uh, 9 and 11 but inr has been very strong inr has somewhere been around 9% uh, but on an average if you see 6 and 1/2 to 9% globally is what uh, uh, silver tends to deliver that's because uh, it is volatile it's not uh, traded much but as and when liquidity starts improving as and when it starts getting traded uh, with serious investors then you know you will start to see uh, some sort of consistency coming in in terms of uh a performance so uh, this volatility hopefully reduces over over periods of time as and when little bit supply also starts coming and otherwise it's going to be very volatile so always uh, look at it from a basket conservative investors definitely need to go towards gold uh somewhere where you know your risk profile says that yes i can take a little bit risk i have a long term horizon a basket approach would work well not one but a basket approach right now uh very interesting data that i got from so where does all the gold really come from like where does it come from we talk about how you know we're mining gold but where do we really go and mine it where are the deposits of gold so uh, a south africa b uh, usa there's china and then there's russia so where is all the gold coming from
I think as Indian investors, we are very, very obsessed with the uh, USA. Uh, be it equity, be it gold, wherever it is, I think we're very obsessed uh, as a community, uh, you know, to look at uh, US. Uh, so, uh, where does the gold really come from? We had a very, very big time between 1940 to 2000, where a lot of gold production, a lot of gold mining was, was done uh, in South Africa. Uh, US happens to be very less. It's just you know, 170 tons. And uh, this number for South Africa has, has you know, come off. Uh, but uh, China leads the pack. China and Russia do lead the pack in terms of gold uh, and gold mining. Uh, yes, rest of the world is there. It's all, uh, yeah. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, there's actually not a lot of study that's done of how much gold is there, you know, in one particular country. It's People do concentrate only uh, you know, on the North American deposit. So that's why if you see US Canada put together is a big number. US Canada put together is a big number. So we can't say US. Yes, US Canada put together is a big number. Uh, but uh, whatever gold mining is happening above the ground uh, is, is all in China. And uh, whatever you see above has all been mined only in the last 200 years. There's nothing that's come out. Right? So now I'm actually going to go into the mining part of, of gold and how investors can really take advantage of uh, gold mining, you know, as an idea. Right? And this data was not there, you know, in my previous presentations. This uh, 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 It was not very difficult for me to find. But yes, uh, you know, with a lot of study also, we found that, yes, uh, how does history really change? Uh, it has gone from South Africa more onto Asian nations. Uh, it has gone onto that pact. It's more in China, more in Russia, more in Australia. Uh, you also saw one of the largest mines uh, buy out another large mine in Australia right? and that was a very fair the deal was at a very fair valuation uh, you can google it uh, it's Newmont uh, but you can google it and you can read about it so we are going the extra mile now uh, we are going to look at the gold mining industry so if you look at the gold mining industry the market cap of uh, the entire gold mining stocks uh, is just 391 billion and uh, it is one third of the entire energy sector so the energy sector consists of oil, gas, uh, coal, everything else. But it's just probably about a third or so in terms of uh, uh, stocks. But if you look at the mining industry, right, uh, the mining industry is as big as your entire energy sector in the US. Okay. But uh, it somewhere trades, you know, at one third of that valuation. And if you look at Apple, Apple is somewhere ahead. So technology uh, has definitely overtook uh, uh, the mining industry all across the world. Right? Uh, so, in terms of life cycle of a mine, right? now this is a very, very important chart because uh, it is a very long process when you have to go from concept uh, to development, right? Your feasibility study itself takes you about two to three years. The entire process is very, very long. You cannot replicate it, basically. You can't say, okay, uh, the, the level of competition that's there is very, very high. Nobody can go out and start, you know, putting in money and say, yes, I'm going to uh, mine gold. It's not very, very easy, right? So if you look at your uh, pre-discovery where you have to, uh, you know, do a lot of study in terms of geology, in terms of uh, soil study, in terms of how that land has developed over multiple years together, uh, that itself takes you four or five years. Right, your discovery takes you another year or so, and then you do all the feasibility study, saying yes, I have found that this is a deposit, and now how much is it going to cost me to go and start mining that gold out, and what is the IRR that I would make on my particular investment on this particular deposit? Right. So it is a big amount of uh, uh, commitment in terms of money. And as well as the time it takes to go out and start mining that gold, right? It takes about seven to eight years for it, for an idea to go, you know, from a concept all the way up until feasibility, and then you go out and start mining that particular gold, right? Depletion is is far ahead, but uh, uh, the whole point is that it takes a long time. Uh, you can't really go out and replicate uh, that particular business. It is a very very costly business, and at the same time. It takes a lot of time. So anybody with deep pockets and deeper pockets can only survive in this one particular industry when it comes to gold. Okay. Now, 
uh, the costs of mining also have gone up, which means it's more and more, it's getting more and more expensive uh, to mine gold, right? And if you see the average size of uh, the gold deposits also, uh, you are seeing somewhere between two, two and a half or 2.5 to be, you know, million ounces uh, as a deposit, the cost of, uh, you know, mining two, two and a half uh, million ounces is just going up. Right. So in the 2000 to 2009 decade versus the 2010 to 2019, that is 20, you're seeing that it's taken a lot of money uh, to go out and start uh, mining that particular gold. 2020 was extremely expensive also because of uh, COVID and going forward also, there were a lot of inflation uh, costs that came in. Right. But the fact is that, yes, to go out and start mining gold, uh, it is becoming much more expensive than it was in the uh, past, which means that it's not very easy. Those who are there will only sort of go out and survive. Right? Now, what has been happening is because gold has gone up, right? because your costs to operate uh, have gone up, naturally, uh, uh, it becomes difficult to supply gold. And uh, because the demand for gold is extremely high, uh, that's why you saw that number of supplies remaining very stagnant, you know, for the last 13 years or so. Uh, in the last three years, we've seen a big jump in terms of gold prices. And that has actually helped uh, gold mining as an industry. Uh, so we had a very bad cycle in terms of gold mining, which I will get to next in a couple of slides. Uh, but they have had the highest cash levels in history. Even the free cash flow uh, levels have turned and they are at a very high level. Uh, so gold prices going up have actually supported mines to go out and sustain these operating costs and actually start supplying that mine. But supply still uh, remains to be very, very stagnant. Right? But what has happened, the scenario for gold mining has actually improved. The last time you saw these numbers was somewhere in 2010, again, where gold prices were extremely high. Then you saw the level starting to come down. That I will get to in the next slide as to why it has been coming down. Here you go. Uh, so what has happened is, in the last cycle of uh, uh, capex you saw that uh, between 2004 2010 uh, it was a very debt fueled uh, capacity addition right all the capacity additions were very debt fueled and uh, when the gold price collapsed in 2013 is what we saw from the chart as well uh, and the asset quilt your uh, mining companies had to uh, delever because they had a lot of debt on their books. The ones who survived, survived. So the industry went through a big wave of consolidation. So for seven years, there was a big wave of deleveraging. Right? And that actually helped them out. Smaller ones that were not able to survive got out of the business or they were bought out by the bigger mines right? or the bigger players. Right. So for seven years, they were going through a big deleveraging cycle and it actually helped the industry because now you see that uh, the industry is flux with cash. And if you see in terms of, you know, uh, CapEx also for the silver miners and gold miners, it has come off from its peak in 2014, right? Again, to do with how expensive it is to go out and, you know, put up that, uh, how it, difficult it is to go out and mine that silver or gold, uh, your CapEx also has sort of come off, right? Which means not many people are spending money to get that gold out. At the same time, the price of that gold remains to be extremely high. So that means what's there, what they're able to mine is what they're able to sell at a very, very high price. Uh, so miners are looking extremely attractive uh, in terms of valuation and uh, M2W investors would know that, uh, you know, we have been able to, uh, uh, we, ha we have been able to and we are continuing to give these calls both in terms of gold, silver and uh, mining. Majorly we are on the gold side and on the gold mining side. But uh, yes, as, uh, as an idea, yes, it is definitely attractive. When it comes to uh, you know looking at these mines, yes, it is extremely risky as well because it takes some time for it to perform. But just as an uh, idea for investors to look at, uh, it does provide a good amount of marginal safety for investors to take advantage of at these levels. Even yesterday on you know Shamsa's Facebook Live, also, we did receive a lot of queries in terms of what is happening to gold and gold mining. So I thought that anyways we are addressing uh, you know the crowd in terms of gold and gold mining as an idea. Uh, so, uh, yes, in terms of ratios also, it is looking extremely attractive. So I'll open the floor for questions now. And if you want me to go through any, go through over any slide, 
uh, I'm very, very happy to do it. But whatever questions you have, do put it in the chat uh, chat box. And we have a good amount of time. We have about 20, 25 minutes uh, where we can engage in Q&A. So I've put in the number and uh, the email ID. So if you are interested uh, in taking advantage of gold and gold mining and how much you should be buying as an investor based on your risk profile, based on your goals, do get in touch with us. Uh, uh, somebody from our team would uh, assist you in terms of opening uh, your account with us as well as uh, starting your investments in gold and gold mining. So whatever questions you have, please do put it in the chat box. So there is a question that came in in the start of the uh, presentation uh, for somebody who is 52 how much percentage gold we can keep uh, it is considered debt allocation or gold gold is to be considered as a separate allocation uh, debt is to be considered as a separate allocation right? same for equity gold equity debt everything needs to be separate as an allocation and needs to be dynamic in nature some some cycles equity might not bode well for you some cycles debt might not bode well for you some cycles gold also might not bode well for you Right. But uh, uh, you have to see based on whatever goal that you, is, is coming to you. You're 52, which means probably you have a retirement goal that is coming up in the next 10 years or so. So you have to consider uh, your risk profile and your goals that are coming up for you to know how much of gold, how much of debt and how much of equity you need to have. But you should consider debt separate, gold separate, equity also separate. uh minimum how much is needed for this year see uh again i don't know in terms of entire portfolio you know how much should be your gold or your gold mining allocation that i'll only know based on your risk profile and based on whatever goals you're getting right but the point is is that yes this is an idea that investors can take advantage of should take advantage of uh but only if you sort of give us those details, we will be able to assist you better in terms of how much uh, uh, you, know, you can do for yourself. Uh, ETF or SGB uh, or MF, which is suitable. Uh, see, it depends on your use case. Uh, either ways, for me, I think that whether you're doing MF or you're doing SGB or you're doing ETF, that money is meant for you to buy gold one day or the other, which is physical. Right? Uh, so if, you're, if you don't want to touch that gold for you know, eight years, 10 years plus, then SGB works for you. It works very, very well. Uh, but if you just want to take advantage of price appreciation and then take a call on what you want to do with physical gold, uh, ETF or mutual funds both are the same. Uh, in any way, the mutual fund would go out and take an exposure in the ETF. So both are the same. Uh, you can consider anyone. How to create wealth in gold for a gold child? Please do SIP. Uh, SIP is the best way for you to create wealth uh, for your child, uh, for yourself also. Uh, when you're looking at, you know, having a marriage corpus, do an SIP. And make sure that you're uh, stepping up your SIP as and when you can, but do an SIP. Uh, after 10 years, what will be the average return? After 10 years, I don't know what, uh, what situation I, I will itself be in. So I don't know what the average return will be in the next 10 years. Uh, but uh, in terms of what, see, you need to look at it. I understand that these questions are uh, going to be there, but the point is for you to look at uh, current scenario and only then take a call. See, the current scenario is that inflation remains sticky. Uh, debt in the US is very, very high. Uh, their deficits also are very, very high, which means that to service that debt, they need inflation. And if inflation comes off, then it's going to be a big problem for them. So this is a cycle where inflation continues to remain high. The wealth disparity is very high. So uh, naturally, you would look you know, for safety. And this is an asset class that can give you safety over a long period of time from what we have seen, unless and until there's a deep problem in the mining industry, uh, which is not there in this particular cycle. So both of them go hand in hand. So we don't see any deep 
problem in terms of uh, mining industry fundamentals. Uh, so the only thing that has to favor gold is uh, you know dollar not remaining strong, and uh, given the current economic condition of uh, US, uh, dollar seems to have peaked out. With uh, gold giving around eight percent, is it true that uh, gold gives uh, returns with equity risk? No, gold and INR is much higher. It's not eight percent. Gold and INR is much higher. If you see the last anybody who had invested since 2018, your gold CAGR would somewhere be around uh, 12 and a half to 13 percent. Right? So uh, it's much higher. Likewise, if you compare equity as well, equity would somewhere be around 13 percent or so. So you know. When you're taking that risk of, of equity, then naturally you should be awarded much higher. Right. So gold as an asset class that is not considered as risky, uh, definitely uh, it has done very, very well. Very, very well is what I would say. What is the difference between gold ETF and global funds? How much percentage profit is expected in global funds? Uh, see, it has done well before. Your global funds have done well before because a lot of liquidity has been pumped into the market. Because liquidity has been pumped into the market, uh, investors have assumed that yes, I have higher risk, so I will go out and start investing money. And they have taken a lot of risk. Right? But if you look at global funds, particularly US, what has done well are only the top seven. In the S&P 500, 493 stocks have not done well. Just the seven stocks have done well. Right. And the uh, now this can't happen, right? Where if, if it's not a broad based rally, then you know we saw it's it's the it's a very similar scenario of to what we saw in 2018, where just the top names did extremely well and the entire broad market did not do well. So, like I said, you can't compare gold to equity, but you can compare equity to equity. And in terms of global funds, uh now is not the right time for you to look at uh, global funds. Anything that you're looking on the global side. Uh, you should be very uh, conscious in terms of what you're paying. That's why gold mining as an industry, uh, it is a global fund. Uh, so we are not averse to taking global exposure. We are taking global exposure wherever we are able to find uh, cheap valuations with high growth. Okay. So your global fund exposure probably can come via the gold mining side because uh, they, they invest in mines across the world. Uh, so it can come from that side. But uh, you know, from a broad based perspective, your valuations are somewhere on the premium side. And the condition also does not look good in terms of US macro. So we would like to wait there, but uh, we are not averse to taking global exposure. The only exposure that we are willing to take is uh, on the gold mining side. Uh, now gold rate is 2045. What will be the rate by this year end? I don't know what the rate will be by this year end. Uh, in 2020, they said $5,000 will be the rate. Some said 6,000, but uh, that's not happened. So don't look at uh, some targets that the newspaper publishes or yeah, whenever there is a bullish case, uh, obviously your, uh, uh, your targets will be very, very high. But uh, what you should actually look at is, uh, is there any downside for me? It doesn't seem like there is a big downside that can come unless and until uh, you know a war breaks out or something bad happens, which again can prove to be very good. But uh, what you need to look at is, is there any downside here going forward? So when we look at investing, we only see, okay, how much downside is actually there uh, for us uh, in terms of a bad scenario? Can we have the appetite to uh, weather through it? If yes, then yes, then definitely you should look at it. What you should look at is not up. You should look at what, how much it can go probably down. And that's, so for this case, it doesn't seem like there's that big of a down, uh, but <clears throat> If you look at equity, uh, definitely there are parts of the market where uh, uh, that is trading at extremely high premium, uh, where the downside risk is very high. Right? But we don't see that for gold. Uh, how many years would it require for gold mining to get minimum return? I don't know what your category of minimum returns are. Whenever I've interacted with investors, they say 25% is my minimum, 30% is my minimum. Uh, but they have probably seen only two years of cycle or three years of you know, bull market. So they are coming off, you know, a bull market. Uh, but five years plus is a very good horizon when you look at uh, investing in such themes. Usually what happens is uh, this, and I have told this in every sort of 
webinar where you know i've presented an idea uh, that uh, you know valuations are fair cheap cheaper fair expensive very expensive uh, so when we uh, you know look to invest we some we look to invest somewhere between fair and cheap the, the case has always been that cheap has become cheaper uh, both in terms of where it has just remained there at the same time where it has gone down further right? where we've had you know price erosion happen but fundamentally there remain strong earnings growth has happened so uh, we are at that place for gold mining where it is cheap and cheaper we are in that place it has not gone to fair valuation we are in the cheap and cheaper side okay uh, so uh, five years plus is a very good horizon for you to look at uh, minimum returns again your expectation should be somewhere around 9 to 12% CAGR. That should be your minimum sort of reasonable expectation when anybody is looking to invest in an equity sort of product. Now, this is not a gold product. Right? This is an equity product. Uh, uh, the mining fund will go out and invest in stocks that mine gold. Right? It's When you look at it, it, it's like comparing it to Tata Steel and uh, your sale and your Hindalco because they go out and start mining you know, those uh, metals. And uh, they are also linked to their ma their margins are also linked to uh, the price of that particular metal. And as the price of that particular metal does well, then the margins improve, and then naturally re-rating happens. Right? What has happened is why re-rating has not happened on the gold mining side is because the costs have gone up. Costs to mine have gone up, and inflation has remained very steady. Right? So the spread has to increase, uh, and as gold does well, then naturally this sector would sort of go out and follow. Uh, I don't think there are any further questions, but uh, do get on to the program. We have a lot of ideas that we are, you know, we have in the pipeline uh, domestically and globally, and we want to invest for MTW investors. So do get in touch with the team. Uh, they will assist you, uh, you know, in, in onboarding with us. Uh, and definitely we would have a fr fruitful engagement also going forward. And that's the endeavor of my show to create a habit of saving create a habit uh, in terms of uh, uh, behavior of what an investor needs to do uh, in one particular market. So uh, that is uh, exactly our endeavor. We want to handhold investors uh, because we understand that yes, uh, market madness is not going to go away. Uh, so it's, uh, it's it's very, very important for us to be rational when, when it comes to investment decisions. Uh, so do get in touch with the team uh, and I'm hoping for a very fruitful engagement going forward. Uh, we we do have other webinars lined up as well uh, from iThought. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, uh, I think it's there online. So if you just look at it, uh, whether it's on Twitter or YouTube, uh, you would get uh, uh, you know the the registration link. So do register for those events as well, uh, and I'll see you somewhere around next week. Uh, there is a can can you sum up? Uh, so we will put it on YouTube. Uh, don't worry about it. We'll put everything on YouTube. And uh, you can see it then also, so no problem. Done. I think we can close. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for joining in on Saturday morning. Have a great weekend. And thank you.